Commission hearings, which is a state agency, each year when Niagara Mohawk applied for an electric rate hike. And they were applying for one every year because they were running a 10 or 12 year old nuclear plant and they were trying to build another one. And the, the, one, the nuke they already had was running into lots of problems and the one they were building, the cost estimates were going like this. And um, so I learned a lot about nuclear power and I learned a lot about electricity and transmission lines and how things are regulated or not regulated very well in New York. And uh, in beginning in 1990, the State government held one of their periodic hearings on the long-range state energy plan. And a man came to that hearing and spoke in opposition to hydroelectric development in Quebec, which was going to have a devastating, which was already having a devastating impact on the land and the water and the peoples of Quebec. And he was asking for help. So I said I would be glad to help. And at the same time, John Funicello, who was the chairman of the Solidarity Committee, he was interested in this issue. And anyways, from 1990 to 1994, the Solidarity Committee was part of a big coalition in, in New York, Pennsylvania, New England, and Quebec. And the New York Power Authority had two contracts with Hydro-Quebec, each of them for $6 billion. And Hydro-Quebec was going to use those contracts to borrow money so that it, can, it could build hydroelectric stations on rivers about 1,000 miles north of here that empty into Hudson Bay. And one of those rivers was the Great Whale River, and another one is the Little Whale River. And so our coalition, we thought that if we could get Governor Mario Cuomo to cancel these contracts, that it would lead Hydro-Quebec to not build those hydroelectric stations. And that's what we did. And so we had, so the, the Cuomo was the target, and the slogan was cancel the contracts. The other slogan was save James Bay. And... Um, so we did quite a bit of organizing, and in 1991, Cuomo canceled one of the contracts, and in 1993, he canceled the other contract. So we won. Hydro-Quebec canceled the projects, and um, these rivers are still flowing free. If you can imagine the, a Great Whale River, it's 240 miles long. There's not a sewer pipe into it. Okay, there's no agriculture along its shore. It's about as pristine a river as you could find anywhere on, on the planet. And... You know, working on those projects is probably the most important, successful endeavor that I was ever involved in in my life. And you know, a lot of people think that hydroelectric development is, is benign, that it's, it's safe, that it's green energy, that it's renewable. But there's different kinds of hydroelectric. If you have a station like at Niagara Falls where you build um, pipes through the rock ar around the waterfall and then some of the water is diverted through those pipes, you're not creating a reservoir. You're just diverting some of the water th through pipes. That's called run of the river. What Hydro-Quebec does is they, they've developed most of those in Quebec, and they find these beautiful rivers, and they build dams and dikes around them, and they create an opening at the end where they build a, a dam. Sorry, they build dikes around the river. Then they build a dam and a power station there, and then gradually the, a reservoir fills in behind the dam and, and alongside the dikes. So they create these giant reservoirs that are the size of counties. And these reservoirs filled up with vegetation which rots and releases methane into the air. And then the ground releases uh, methylmercury into the water. Mm -hmm. So it, it poisons the water and it poisons everything in it. And it, uh, it actually worsens climate change because you get methane coming out of the water into the atmosphere. So. Um, so these types of projects are, they're not as safe as the industry wants us to think. Um, and anyways, anyways, we were very lucky that we were able to, to, save, the, to save those rivers. Hydro-Quebec has continued to build hydroelectric stations, not quite as far north as that, and destroying rivers. And um, they're continuing to do it right now. The Romaine River, which is about maybe seven or 800 miles east of here, which flows south into the St. Lawrence River, is being wrecked with these big reservoirs. Anyways, with that bit of an introduction, I'd like to introduce Roberta Benefiel, who lives in Labrador, as I said. And she is um, part of a major coalition that's trying to block the destruction of the Churchill River. Um, Roberta is the co-founder, vice president, and ri of Riverkeep. Let me 
is the co-founder, vice president, and riverkeeper for Grand Riverkeeper Labrador, a, a member of the nearly 300 member strong international organization, Waterkeeper Alliance. Ms. Benefield continues to be actively involved in the fight to save not just her own river, the Churchill in Labrador from massive dams, but has broadened her fight to include the last remaining wild rivers throughout Canada, where Canadian <coughs> provincial crown corporations and large contractors conspire to create dams on every possible site. Okay. So this, these projects in Labrador and Quebec, they're really not for the people of Labrador and Quebec, because very few people live in Labrador. In Quebec, they have a massive amount of electricity already, electrical generating capacity installed. These projects are for export to New York and New England and any place south of there where people would be willing to buy them. Yeah. So among the questions that I think we need to be thinking about are, you know, who's going to make the decisions here? You know, and should indigenous peoples have the right to veto destructive projects proposed for their traditional territories? Should anybody or should any government or corporations be able to literally destroy rivers? And should electricity be generated more than a thousand miles from away from where it's going to be used? Okay. So with that in mind, here's Roberta Benefield. I think I have a pretty good voice. I don't think I need that. Is anybody not, is anybody not able to hear me properly? I can go back there, but I wanted to uh, be out here next to the uh, next to the computer so I can kind of follow along. Do you want to shut off the light here? Yeah. Yes, sure, that would make it easier on everybody. I think. So thank you for the introduction. I, I appreciate the the effort that people that have what? gone through to... Can you, uh, can you see Ron? Pardon me? Can you see well enough? I can see well enough. Yes, I'm fine. How about you guys? Can you put the screen back to the angle you had it? Oh, sorry. More vertically. That way? Yeah, the other way. That's better? Oh, yeah. Okay, it'll it'll stay. I just messed with it. Is that better? So we've called this little tour, um, which started out in Labrador and went first to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where we had about 35 people show up, and then we ended up in... Belfast, Maine, and then we went to Portland, Maine to talk to the uh, Conservation Law Foundation. Um, is, any, is everyone here familiar with the Conservation Law Foundation, the CLF? Well, they've, uh, they've actually uh, signed on in Lake Champlain, Lake Keeper, which is also a member of the same uh, Waterkeeper Alliance that Grand River Keeper is a member of, and they have signed on to accept funds from Blackstone uh, for the uh, power line, the clean power line that's going under Lake Champlain. So we have a bit of a um, controversy there. And then also our Hudson River Keeper in New York has also signed on with Blackstone to accept money from Blackstone, the proponents of the Champlain-Hudson Power Express that would take power underneath the, uh, with subsea cables underneath the uh, Hudson River. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that later on with the Waterkeeper Alliance. But right now, I'm out here discussing the fact that our river is being destroyed while two more river keepers are actually signing on to transmission projects that, it, that are bringing water, power from my river. Hydro-Quebec has about 5,000 megawatts of extra power. My river, the first project that was ever built on my river is 5,500 megawatts, and Hydro-Quebec controls that, that power, all but 300 megawatts of it, because of the 1969 contract that they signed to finish a project that was in trouble. So they made a good contract, and they actually control that river or contro and control that project until 2041. Now, I gotta figure out how to do this while I'm... Uh, Can you see? Okay. okay, so why should it matter in the northeastern United States? I know that's really small, and we can give you copies of this later, but this is the list of all of the projects that are under consideration right now. This one here, the brand new one, is the Empire Project. I'm not sure. I can't remember the exact em name. Empire State Connector. Thank you. Empire State Connector. And yesterday or today? 
it received the president's uh, permit. Per so it's <coughs> permitted. I don't know and don't understand how your process takes place down here, but apparently that permit is, is really top notch. And then from there, it's up to the Massachusetts uh, government whether or not they decide on accepting power from this particular project or some other project. But anyway, it's been permitted. All of these are, are transmission lines that are in the works right now. So all of these transmission lines, like Tom said, they're all coming down here in some shape or form from New York to New Hampshire to Vermont to Connecticut, all across the northeastern United States, which is why I felt like finally we've done everything we can at home and we need to come down here and talk to you folks and let you know how things are going with us. And also because there are major issues with those projects, like Tom just said, there's poisoning of traditional food, uh, the cultural genocide. When you take away food from Inuit people and Inu people uh, and, and damage their food supply, their traditional food supply, you're basically uh, damaging their culture because I have to tell a little story with this that uh, some friends dropped by my kennels this summer and left two of their dogs and they took a trip up north. Uh, on the coastal boat called the Northern Ranger. And when they got as far as Hopedale, which is one of the north, north Coast communities in Labrador, she sent me back a picture. She actually posted it on Facebook and I caught it that way. And it was a picture of four hamburgers. They were in a package, they were half price at the, at the government store in Hopedale. They had been marked down from $28.99 to $14.50, half price for four freezer-burned hamburgers. So when you take away the food supply with methylmercury, when you poison their food supply and take that food supply away from them, that is the kind of food that they have to go to the store and buy. The jobs are very scarce up north, and it's, it's, it is cultural genocide to take the food and the seal meat and the, and the fish that these people eat. This is just a map of Canada's major watersheds. This one right here is the watershed of our river, the Grand River, or the Churchill River is what it's called on the map. It's 93,000 square kilometers. So it's not a tiny watershed. Our river is 530 miles long from where it starts until it empties out into uh, Grosswater Bay in, uh, in the uh, Atlantic. Oh, could you point where that is? Want me to go back? I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, could you point where, where it empties out? Like where, 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 okay. There's a better picture coming up. Okay. This one is too okay. small for you okay. to see. Okay, great. So. Okay, so here's Labrador. Here's Newfoundland. And this is the Maritime Provinces, New Brunswick, PEI, and Nova Scotia. The river, you see that little blue line right there? Mm -hmm. That's Lake Melville. Our river comes from right about here and goes right out through to Grosswater Bay, which is out here in the ocean. The Labrador Current runs this way. This is the part. This is Angaba, and La, and uh, over right over here is Hudson Bay. So the reason this picture is up there is to show you all of the different portions of this project or these projects. This is Churchill Falls that went in into operation in 1970, about 71, 72. I think they started generators at different times, so it's uh, questionable exactly what date. And that's been operating ever since, and Hydro-Quebec owns most of the power from there. So anytime they generate power and sell it to the United States, at any given moment, it can be power coming from our river. Down here towards this little dot in the center, that would be Gull Island. This one right here is Muskrat Falls. Those two projects were, uh, went through an environmental assessment in 2012 and received the government's uh, uh, nod to go ahead. However, the joint panel, five people on the joint panel for the environmental assessment had many, many discrepancies that they wanted fixed before anything ever happened. And they said that if Muskrat Falls was the only project that these people do, that they should not do it, period. 
But because it was a political decision, because this is a political project, it went ahead anyway. Because the ministers of the environment of the province and of the federal government had the last word. So the, the power then would come from Muskrat Falls right here. It goes down through Labrador, through pristine forests. A massive, massive transmission line has been cleared. And it goes across uh, the Straits of Belle Isle right here in a subsea cable, goes down through the northern peninsula of Newfoundland and across to Soldier's Pond, and that would help uh, power up some of the, uh, the Avalon Peninsula where the seat of government for Newfoundland is, Newfoundland and Labrador. Then it comes across the island again and goes down another subsea cable right here and into uh, Nova Scotia. The company in Nova Scotia is called Emira. It has uh, holdings in Canada and the United States. And what Amira is going to get from the Muskrat Falls project, which is this one right here, the one we're talking about tonight, is uh, free electricity for 35 years. And that's because their part of the deal was to build this transmission line, the red one. Okay? So we're going to sell, give to Amira uh, about 44% of the, pro of the power from Muskrat Falls, which is 824 megawatts. That's a maximum they can get for 35 years free. The rest of the power will be used in Labrador, in Newfoundland, not in Labrador. No power used in Labrador, none. So what that means is that Amira is able to take that power and run it down through this particular power corridor they're going to use, uh, build some wind power over here in New Brunswick, and then they're going to take Muskrat Falls power as part of their backup power, and they're going to send right down here to Plymouth Rock, to Plymouth. Sorry, I keep saying Plymouth Rock, because that's where we were for the, for the um, event. But they'll take it down to Massachusetts, to Plymouth. And so um, Emira has put in a bid for that 1,000 megawatts of power, and so has Hydro Quebec, and it's up to the, the government cable of. Cable comes in Plymouth. Pardon me. The cable will come in at Plymouth. Yes, yes. it's a subsea cable, and it's okay. 350 miles long, I think. Okay, no, I know we're fine. That's why I want to put Plymouth up there. Yes, and it com it comes ashore at Plymouth, right near where the old um, uh, they have a, a, a nuclear plant that they're trying to shut down. And I think they're going to shut that down. And so they're going to come right in, right beside where the nuclear plant is. And of course, that's a big selling point, OK? Good, clean hydro and get rid of the nukes. I beg to differ. It's not good and clean. This is, our river. This is the upper Muskrat Falls. This is its pristine state. Can you see, everybody see it from there? I'm sorry to be in your way, if, if I am, just holler. There's the lower falls in its pristine state. How, how wide is that? Um, oh my. Any idea? Or? Right there? It's not very wide, actually. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's a silly answer, but I can't tell you how wide it is. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's a question I've never been asked before. Oh, I can this is, <laughs> we love to go up, we used to love to go up to Muskrat Falls and, and walk out to the falls and go down on the rocks and, and we would sit on these rocks right here and watch this massive, it's easy to see why they want the power from that river because it is massive, massive power. It's not high, it's only about 80 feet high, but it's a massive amount of water coming through there. Is that, is that a much wider river and then it narrows? Then? Yes, it narrows right there. Yeah. And then it widens out again. Uh -huh. It starts out up at Muskrat, at, at uh, Churchill Falls, very narrow. And the, the banks of the river are like 900 feet high. And that's exactly why Churchill Falls was, was built to begin with, because it's so high that the water drops down into the penstocks and it really creates an up. It's kind of like the Niagara Falls thing, except yeah. that Hydro-Quebec and Brinko went in there and put all these uh, structures in to to bring all of the rivers together on the height of land into one huge reservoir. Smallwood Reservoir was the largest man-made reservoir in the world when it was built. It could take Prince Edward Island, put it down in the middle, and you wouldn't even know it was there. The whole island of Prince Edward Island. 
This is down at the bottom. This is the, the, the lower falls right here. And this is Spirit Mountain off to the right. The Innu uh, talk about Spirit Mountain as a, uh, a spirit or unkind spirit. They're always afraid of the Spirit Mountain. And they call it Manitou. I can't think of the word. Anyhow, it's, it's, it's something that the Innu have always been afraid of. And the Innu always, they would come up the river and they go to the right, to the north of that spirit mountain, and they had their, their campsites on what we now call the North Spur. And then this is a picture that will give you a little bit better idea. Here are the two falls. This is the upper falls. This is the lower falls. Here is Spirit Mountain, Manitouchou. I knew I could say it if I could see it. There's Spirit Mountain, and this little neck of land here is called the North Spur. And it's, that neck of land is full of quick clay. Does, does anybody here know what quick clay is? Have you ever heard of quick clay or lita clay? It's a, it's a marine clay that's been laid down centuries and centuries ago when the ocean was actually over top of all this land. So as the ocean receded, slowly but surely in layers and layers and layers, this quick clay or lita clay was laid down and over centuries, the salt has leached out of this clay and it's become extremely unstable. It can liquefy, okay? So what, that's one of the major problems that we have with this project and one a reason why we're very, very uh, concerned about it. What, uh, what, what would the project do to it? I mean, what, what would making, flooding it do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> The reason it's unstable is because of saturation of water and movement. Uh -huh. So what we're worried about is that when they fill the reservoir, that, that area there is going to be used as a natural dam. Uh -huh. Let me go back. To, <laughs> let me go back. You see, this is the river up here. That's the upstream. This is downstream. No, sorry, backwards. This is upstream. That's downstream. So they're going to put a dam here. And they're going to put another one way over here because when they back that up, it's going to flood right out into here a long ways. They, go, they use this as a natural dam. So this area that's fraught with, with quick clay is going to be used as a natural dam. I don't know if any of you saw those, uh, the, that big uh, poster over there, but those are, are core samples that one of our uh, informers sneaked out from the uh, project, he was a driller, and those that's the muddy stuff. Mm -hmm. He's got pictures of nothing, the, the, the plastic came up with nothing but water in it, and it all drained out. So down into this North Spur, where he did his drilling all in through here, that's where that mud came from, lots and lots of it. So you could have like a landslide or a shift? Yeah, let me show, I'll show I, have a, I have a slide showing you one of the landslides. There's landslides on our river, in our riverbanks constantly over time. This is what it looks like on the south side of the river now, or a few months ago. Here there's, there's a coffer dam, they're building that. Here is the, the, the spillway where they have these big gates that they open and close whenever they want to let water out. This whole area over here is just completely inundated. There's not a tree left over there. It's just, it's, this is the North Spur. Here is Spirit Mountain, right here. The trees are left on that, but that's all the trees that are left. They've taken everything off of the North Spur. They're trying to stabilize it, okay? They think they know what they're doing. They have never, ever in the history of mankind built a, a dam on this amount of quick clay. It's going to be 100 feet high, the reservoir is. So again, another reason why we're really concerned. And the reason, big reason we're concerned is because we have communities 36 kilometers or 20 miles down from this, from this dam. 100 feet high of water can hit the community of Mud Lake in less than an hour. And there's no way anyone, it, if, if it goes, quick clay goes like that. It liquefies just like that. How it may be pressure, it may be extra water, it may be both, it may be lots of rain. There's all kinds of reasons why this clay can give way and, and lose its uh, consistency. This is a picture of the dams that are, now, it's confusing because Churchill Falls is one project, 
Gull Island is another project. Muskrat Falls is another project. So on our river, there's a possibility of three hydro projects. But at Muskrat Falls, there are three dams. There is the north, uh, the south dam over here. Remember I showed you how the water was going, when it's backed up, it's going to go over into the, into the south side. Here are the gates, and this is the north dam. This is Spirit Mountain right here. From there on is the North Spur, the, quote, natural dam. So how did the government get to this situation? Several years ago, we had a premier named Danny Williams. Now, mind you, ever since the Churchill Falls project was built, they have, uh, like, the, the engineers, you can see their eyes glistening when you talk about uh, Gull Island and Muskrat Falls. They've been thinking about this, these two projects for centuries. <laughs> Not centuries, but since at least 1970 when the other project got finished. So they've been talking about it, and, and first one and then the other premier, every single premier since we have had the Churchill Falls project wants to do the Gull Island and the Muskrat Falls project. Well, Danny Williams decided he was going to, but he couldn't get any deal with Hydro-Quebec because he went to Hydro-Quebec with an attitude, with a rotten attitude, as a matter of fact. And Hydro-Quebec said, we don't want to do that project. We've got all, all kinds of power. We don't need your river. We've got the La Romaine. We've got this. We've got that. We don't want to deal with you. So Danny got upset and said, OK, we'll do it on our own. We'll do it the uh, Anglo-Saxon route, he called it. And that was the route I showed you where it went down through Newfoundland and down through uh, uh, Nova Scotia. So what they did, what he did while he was in power, he had a huge monopoly. He could do anything he wanted in the House of Commons. And he created Nalcor Energy, a monopoly. Bill 60 and 61 created this monopoly so that no one else no other entity of any kind on the, in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador can sell power on the power grid. That, that's law. Not even a wind energy. If you build a wind energy project in your own yard, you can use it all you want to, but you cannot sell back any power on the power grid. Okay? So it stifles all the, all the possibilities of building any kind of solar or wind and sharing it out so that we don't have to dam any more rivers. It forces the Public Utilities Board, that's our utility regulator, to accept all the Muskrat Falls related costs when setting final power rates because Nalcor Energy owns the subsidiary, which is Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro. That's our utility. That's the one that's regulated. But what they did is they forced Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro into a take or pay contract. Mm -hmm. So that no matter whether Newfoundland Hydro needs it or not, they have to pay for whatever happens and whatever is produced by Nalcor. Now the reason they did that is because Newfoundland is poor and they had a, a, a really bad, um, not bad, but a, a, a less than perfect uh, uh, payback um, over the years, like when you when you have your uh, um, what's the word I'm looking credit for? Rating. Credit rating. Thank you. So they had a less than great credit rating, and their credit rating was going to add millions and millions of dollars to the cost of this project. So they wanted the federal government to do uh, a loan guarantee that would allow them to have the federal government's credit rating, which is AA, AAA, as a matter of fact. So the federal government said, the only way we'll do that is if you can guarantee us that this project's going to pay, be paid for by the ratepayers. And this is what resulted. This take or pay contract says that no matter how high this project goes, no matter what the cost, we get to pay for it. Mm. And I want to explain a little bit about our projects, our utility companies. I think down here most of your utility companies are privately owned. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Maybe regulated, but privately owned. Yes. So if they couldn't make money, they wouldn't be in business. 
That's not the case in Canada, okay? All of our, our utilities are called Crown Corporations. So it means that we, the people, are the shareholders. Each province is responsible for energy. So each province has its own Crown Corporation or two, like Ontario Hydro is one, Manitoba Hydro is another, BC Hydro is another, and I'm, maybe some of you have even heard about this new uh, uh, project, Site C, in British Columbia. There's a big, huge controversy about it. It's exactly the same situation as what's going on with Nalcor in Newfoundland and the Muskrat Falls project. The thing about our utilities, the thing about our utilities is their monopolies. So we have kind of the same situation, except it goes to a private corporation. Okay. They could propose projects that are total boondoggles, and they get they get rates that pay for them plus a profit. So okay. It's very similar. It is very similar because Nalcor is yeah. guaranteed eight percent profit. Right. Right. Okay. Each, yeah. So it's very similar. But if they fail, if they somehow fail, who ends up paying their bills? Do they? Go bankrupt? The customers. Yeah. The customers. The customers. Well, it's the same situation they, at home. Yeah, they just apply for a rate increase. Pardon me? They apply for a rate increase. Okay, and do they always get it? Yeah. Uh, they get it if it, they were going to go bankrupt. They get it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, so I guess yeah. that I'm sort of not into how your utilities work down here, but for us, yeah. 550,000 of us are now in debt for $12.7 billion, okay? That project started out at $2.9 billion. That's what they said it was gonna be. When they sanctioned it, it was up to $6.2 billion. At least they agreed on some of the cost and let some of the cost out. But right now, as far as we know, at this point, based on about eight, nine months ago, the bill is at $12.7 billion. The cost of Muskrat Falls power if they even get 824 megawatts out of it, is 65 cents a kilowatt hour. Huh? 65, it's the most expensive power on the globe. <laughs> what they're gonna do, now remember they're giving 40% of that to Emira for free until for 35 years. So what's happening to the rest of the power is going to Newfoundland. We have enough power in Labrador, we don't, it, it makes coal a, a, great, a great bargain. It makes what? Coal a great bargain. Oh, it makes everything a great bargain, I mean, at that price. But what they're going to do is they're going to, right now the island in Newfoundland, is their rates are right around nine, ten cents a kilowatt hour. Because they do have one big hydro project called Bay to Spare in Newfoundland, and then they have some more uh, uh, smaller hydro projects, but they have a a moratorium on hydro in Newfoundland. No more rivers are allowed to be dammed in, in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. Yet they can come up where we are, where we only have 27,000 people in an area the size of Texas, mm -hmm. and they can do whatever they bloody well please to us because we don't have enough people to vote them out. We never will. Mm -hmm. right. I hope to God we never have enough people, but I do hope we get our own government at some point. <laughs> so you're part of you're part of Newfoundland. Yes. As a province. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> we would like to not be. We are a totally different culture. You know, I can I can talk like this because I was born in Newfoundland. My parents lived in Newfoundland. My family lives in Newfoundland. I went to Labrador as an eight-month-old child, and I'm Labradorian by choice, is what I always say. <laughs> But growing up in Labrador and seeing all of the things that have been dragged out of Labrador year after year after year, like the iron ore in Labrador City, it, the pellet plant is in Settil, Quebec. So all our people get to do is drag the ore out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Up in Voises Bay, same situation. They drag the nickel out of the ground and the copper, and it goes down to a smelting plant in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. It's just horrendous it what happens. like a colony. Pardon me? Sounds like you're treated like a colony, like we treat Puerto Rico. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> but the same thing. So um, what did I want to say here? Oh, here, right here is the, uh, the uh, uh, Natural Resources Minister, Jerome Kennedy. He's on CBC News saying, however, there will be no new generation allowed under the act. 
I mean, the fact is there that it is illegal for anyone else to sell any power on the power grid. So this is the take or pay contract. I've already talked about that. This is a young fellow, Nick Mercer. He came up and did a presentation a couple of months ago about wind energy. Go back to that map. You, if you folks looked at the map and you saw the coast of Labrador, remember I said all down the coast of Labrador on the Atlantic uh, Ocean side. All of our communities on the coast of Labrador are on diesel. Still, yeah. with 5,500 megawatts being produced just upstream from where I live, about 500 kilometers, and, and being sold out through Quebec, coming down here, but all of our coastal communities are still on diesel. So this young fellow wanted to get involved with one of the Aboriginal groups and try to get into the communities and get some wind power into the communities. You hear what he says? Essentially, it's against the law to build wind energy mm. in Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm. He wants you to do to it. You can't use it there? You Pardon can't me? Even, you can't even have it to use locally. No, no, you can have your own in your backyard. But you can't have any grid. But you can't build a power grid right. in a community. Grid, yeah. you, you can't put up enough power, enough wind power, to maybe supplement with diesel, but use the wind. And I'm telling you, on the coast of Labrador, there's no problem with wind. Mm. Is there it's the... Uh, it's the Atlantic Ocean. Is there anyone suing? Is there? Is there anyone suing on the grounds that that's, that's an illegal law? <laughs> we, you know, we belong to the Waterkeeper Alliance. That's one of the things that they love to say, that, you know, sue them, sue them, yeah. sue them. And they do a lot of that yeah. here in the U.S. Yeah. It's not possible for us. The way our laws are written, if we file a lawsuit, the Governor General takes a look at it, and if he, thinks it's a, if he thinks that it's a good lawsuit, he can do one of two things. He can say, I'll take it over. Oh. Okay? And he'll go forward with it. And we're out of the picture. As the but if he doesn't go forward with it, it sits there. And trust me that the government of Newfoundland, there's a click, and it moves from one click to the next click, and they're back and forth all the time. And the governor general is not going to go against that click. What is the governor general? Uh, I don't know. I honestly, it is so confusing to why, me. Why don't we wait on questions yeah. until she's yeah, finished? Yeah, it's just really too confusing to, for me to even explain it to you because I don't even understand it. I just know that it's almost impossible for us to file a lawsuit. And besides that, it costs too much money. And besides that, it's such a small area. All the lawyers are in St. John's, Newfoundland, mm -hmm. most of them, and they all, nobody will go against the government because they'll never get another government contract. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, these are all, this is all information about NALCOR. So I want to talk about the mismanagement that NALCOR has done with this project over time. Remember I told you it started out at 2.9 billion. It went to 6.2 billion is what the cost was going to be when they sanctioned the project. We had a couple of uh, whistleblowers, a couple of engineers who went directly to CBC. They went to a, a blog called Uncle Gnarly Blog. And I have some papers back there that uh, um, are going to be passed out later if you want to pick one up that's got links to these uh, sites mm -hmm. that you can go on and read some of the information. Um, they, it, the, the engineer that went on CBC had his voice concealed because he signed a disclosure agreement when he went to work for NALCOR that said he would never open his mouth about what was going on. They were told before the entire project went ahead that they were not to accept contracts that were going to put the project over $7 billion. They had to keep the project below $7 billion. Why? Because wind and solar and small hydro alternatives to this project were $7.6 billion. Mm -hmm. And they had to keep it down below $7 billion. Well, they did keep it down and kept it secret for a long time because also NALCOR is exempt from access to information, also legislated. Mm -hmm. So for years, we're trying to find out things about what's going on at NALCOR, and we are not told because it's 
uh, considered proprietary in information or, uh, you know, they, they can think up any excuse they want to to say that we can't let that information out. So these people are telling us that they knew what was going to happen to the price, and it's now at $12.7 billion. And you divide that by $5 debt before this project even started. We're at, another thing that Nalcor did, there's so many things, but I, just a few of the really major things. Astaldi won the contract. Astaldi is an Italian company. They won the contract to uh, build the uh, uh, powerhouse. Not the powerhouse, sorry. The structure, spillway structure. And they said they could pour the concrete in the wintertime if they built a dome. This is the dome. It doesn't look like a dome, and I, I never did understand why they called it a dome, but they had it half built. And they found out later, after they'd spent all this money and all this time, that they couldn't heat it enough to pour the concrete in minus 40 degrees. So I'm sitting at my desk one day, and I see all these trucks, one after the other, Every 30 minutes or so, these monster trucks are going by my window, and they're loaded with this stuff here. I'm thinking, where is that coming from? There couldn't be but one project. So I go down next to the, uh, it's about a half a mile down from my cabin, and this is, all of this stuff is piled up. So they, they took it all apart, took it down to the dump site, and left it. What, what is that stuff? What is that stuff? Where is it? Construction and demolition? That's steel girders, brand new. For the dome? For the dome. They took it down because they realized it wasn't going to work. Because Astaldi had never built a concrete anything in that kind of weather before. Right now, they've stopped pouring concrete at minus three. It was minus three back in October. They were going to build all winter, they said. Another thing that happened, some more waste. The transmission line was 170 kilometers long. So double line, 340 kilometers. Uh, the DC conduct conductor wire was spun at the factory, shipped, stored, and erected before anyone at Nalcor noticed that there was one wire that was sticking out. The problem with that would have been that going down over the northern peninsula, especially, the winds there are absolutely vicious in the middle of the winter. And one little wire out like that could cause all kinds of havoc for that whole power line. So they had to take it all down. We don't know how much that cost us. But again, it's costing us. There's some of that wire. Beautiful stuff. All. There's another issue. 400,000 cubic meters of wood have been cut for this project. And still they haven't cleared the reservoir. They've only cleared a, what they call the bathtub ring where the drawdown will be for this project. Uh, you know, our communities on the coast, like I said, they're on diesel. They all have wood stoves because being on diesel doesn't mean you can burn whatever you want to in electricity either. You're only allowed to get to a certain amount at the subsidized rate. If you go beyond that, your rate goes through the roof, completely through the roof. So they all have wood stoves so that they can keep their light bill down and they don't go over the allotted amount. All this wood is sitting there for three years now, all the way from my community, all down through Labrador and all down through Newfoundland, rotting. We've asked Nalcor, why don't you get the wood up to the communities on the coast? Not their job. What were they going to use the wood for? To burn, to keep their houses warm in minus 50 degrees. It's, it's sitting there rotting. They, Nalcor had to cut all this wood in order to put the transmission line through and in order to, to make it safe around the perimeter of the reservoir. Okay. So a little bit about the North Spur. Again, this is, this, here we are. This is the Lower Falls. This is the Upper Falls. This is before any of the work took place. Right here is a 1978 landslide. That whole area slumped all in one failed swoop. A couple of friends of mine, uh, older friends, um, 
they were up on the little island. There's a, there was a little island right down here. It's since been uh, washed away. But they were there in their motorboat, camped at night, and they heard a huge noise. They didn't know what it was. They got up the next morning, and they, they took their motorboat up, and all of that, of course, it's all uh, filled in with trees now, so it doesn't look near as dangerous, but that whole bank had fallen into the river. This is the water line. This is upstream from, from, the, from the North Spur. This is the area that's got quick clay in it. And you can see how that would happen over centuries. The river has come down, it hits this rock knoll right here, and slows down. So sediment is dropped out right here, and the sediment happens to be clay that's, that's really, really fine and can, can liquefy. And that's just how it happened. And so here's where the water level will be when they finish, 100 feet up. We have asked and asked and asked NALCOR and the government and everyone concerned that we can think of, our MHA, our MP, whoever we could think of, we've sent letters, we've begged, please let us get an independent assessment of this North Spur. They would not listen. NALCOR continually told us that their, uh, their engineers knew what they were doing and therefore there was nothing for us to worry about. As you can see from the back, uh, backlash here. I mean, the wood is all rotting. The the, the uh, power cable had to be taken down. The uh, dome had to be taken down. There's so many other things I could tell you, but there's just not enough time in the night to explain what Nalcor has done over the last three, four years. So we said we want an independent expert. Nobody would listen to us. So we reached out to this fellow, Dr. Stig Bernander, who is in Sweden who has been working on quick clay issues in the Netherlands and Sweden and Norway and Denmark for years. And he actually, they call him the rock star <laughs> of quick clay. In fact, he, he says he did, he did his dissertation in mud. <laughs> so we gathered up some money and we paid his way over. And he went into St. John's and he met at the LSPU hall and talked to a lot of people there. It was a, full house, everybody was interested. And then he came up to Labrador. We took him up in a helicopter because one of our uh, groups uh, had a, some helicopter time. So we took him up for two hours. He looked at the entire river, right from our area down in Goose Bay, right on up to Gull Island and uh, where, where the next project would be uh, built. He looked at the river on both sides and he said, these are classic examples of downhill progressive slides. Now, of course, says there's no sign of a downhill progressive slide in this riverbed, in this river valley. Dr. Bernander looked over to the right when we got to Gull Island. I was sitting right behind him, and he, he was talking in a, um, one of those uh, microphones to us in, in our earphones, and he said, Roberta, <laughs> you look over there. That is an, an ancient downhill uh, progressive slide. A classic example. <laughs> I said, thank you, Dr. Bernander. But we can't get the government or NALCOR to agree to bring Dr. Bernander over here. He just did a complete report, the final one of five, and he said, in the opinion of this author, Dr. Bernander, the NALCOR energy response generally reflects little interest or lack of know-how of the intricacies, and I spelled that wrong, related to highly porous soils and the conditions of sensitivity that may lead to downhill or forward progressive failure development in potentially extensive landslides. This is this final report. November 26, he wrote it, just a few days ago. Furthermore, there are specific important issues which have not been dealt with in reference 9D. He had several references in his report. Among other, the efficiency of the reliability of the finger drains for the prevention of conceivable downhill uh, progressive failure development. Remember I showed you the picture where they were working on the North Spur and they had all this uh, land cleared out and they were putting a layer of uh, some kind of fabric that would allow water to run through it? He's very, very skeptical about that. 
And again, if that North Spur fails with 100 feet of water in there, we got 60 something people in the community of Mud Lake and along the river banks of, of Happy Valley Goose Bay that won't know what hit them. They'll be underwater in less than an hour. And there is absolutely no, um, there's no evacuation plan for either community. And our community, our town hall, we've, we've had so many meetings with Abbey Valley Goose Bay town councilors and they keep saying, it's not, we can't afford that. We don't know what to do and NALCOR won't help us. NALCOR won't, they say they're not responsible. They're building the dam, but they're not responsible for getting an evacuation plan in, in place. We don't, depending on the time of the year, Mud Lake may not, there's probably not a way to evacuate. Yeah. Because if it happens to be during freeze up or, or uh, break up in the spring, they can't get in their boats and they can't get on their snow machines to come across the river. There's no way. And there's no way to get that many people out with a helicopter in less than an hour. In fact, you'd have way less than an hour because by the time they make the phone calls to call their RCMP and the town yeah. or whoever, by that time you've lost 10 or 15 minutes anyway. So it's a real serious concern. This fellow is a retired hydro engineer. He actually worked on the Churchill Falls project. He's been retired for several years. We reached out to him. He says he believes what Dr. Bernander says. This man is, these people, they're not being paid. They're not like NALCOR's engineers who are being paid for this, okay? These people are doing this because they know there's a problem. This fellow here, uh, Maurice Adams, writes a blog. He said, uh, my summary thoughts on Dr. Bernander's most recent report were that it affirms that the resultant safety factors that NALCOR has assigned to the North Spur are not supported by appropriate sufficient geotechnical investigations. Mm -hmm. And the analytical methods relied on by NALCOR are not best suited to the North Spur, i.e. the soil, pressure, and slope conditions that are vulnerable to progressive or retrogressive failure. So that's you know three, basically three experts who are doing this out of the kindness of their heart. I mean, Dr. Bernander is 87 years old. There's times when I call Dr. Bernander that I wonder when the phone doesn't get answered right away, I think, oh God, he's gone. <laughs> I keep saying he, when he answers, he always says, I'm still here, Roberta. <laughs> okay. That's good, Dr. Bernander. <laughs> here are some of the clay soils. This is on the North Spur after all the trees were removed. Here they are working on, this is their finger drain right here. This is what they're laying down, hoping that the water on the other side, the upstream side, this is the downstream side of the North Spur. They have put a, a wall or a blanket, a membrane on the upstream side down 70 feet to the, to the clay, the lower clay layer. Below the lower clay layer is an aquifer. Bedrock is 900 feet down. <laughs> so at any given time, water from the upside of the river is flowing through this aquifer and out underneath the spur. And in fact, right out about here, there's a big deep hole that's several hundred feet deep that has been scoured out. And some of these geotechnical experts believe that it's because the water from upstream is going under the spur and scouring this out. But Nalcor tells us that their experts have looked at that and that's not the way things are and everything is gonna be fine. All of this right here is just loose, sloppy clay. I, you pick that up in your hand and it's like solid when you pick it up and you do like that a little bit and it becomes liquid. I took some of it home and, and I had the geotechnical expert told me how to, how to check on it because we had a, a small slide upstream of Muskrat Falls during the winter. And we went up on our snowshoes and we gathered up some of this stuff and we took it home. So what he had me do was put it in a bowl and get an electric mixer and mix it with the electric mixer. And when I did, the minute I hit it, it turned completely liquid. Mm -hmm. I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. Wow. It's gonna fail. So this is the North Spur. That was that, that's that beautiful area that had all those trees. We used to walk up through there, and in the wintertime, mm -hmm. we'd go up on our snow machines, and we'd go down to the falls with our snowshoes. That's, that's what that is now. 
This area right here, this is the uh, Spirit Mountain over here on, the, uh, on this side and, and the North Spur goes that way. This little area right here is what most of our friends, our geotechnical friends say is going to be the weakest spot in the North Spur because normally this is a little trickle of uh, um, water coming out through here. And NALCOR actually didn't do any tests. They didn't take any samples, or at least they tell us they didn't take any samples from this area right here. Mm -hmm. And their, their logs of the core samples that they took are, uh, what is the word I want to use? Uh, it's Proprietary. silent <laughs> on that area. Pardon me? Proprietary. Problem. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, proprietary information. Uh, because that's where we believe, that's where a lot of our geotechnical experts believe that, that this North Spur is going to fail, right next to the rock, right next to the rock knoll. This is the area that the old trappers used to climb up over. This is like 700 feet. And they would climb up, they'd bring their canoes up this far, and they'd climb up over that, portage up over that, down the other side, and then go on up the river for their trapping grounds. This is to the right. I took that picture when we went up by boat one day. All of this right here, you can go along and smack it like this, and it just turns liquid. This is the picture of the same, same um, uh, core samples that are over there in a larger uh, format. So the next big issue we have with this project is methylmercury poisoning. Now we've talked a little bit about it so far. Um, the Harvard, we, okay, to start with, we, we talked about methylmercury poisoning because we learned from, during the environmental assessment hearings, because we learned from other projects that, like, like the Great Whale, not the Great Whale, the, um, uh, Chesapeake and, and a few places up in northern Quebec, that methylmercury was a big issue when you flood vegetation. Mm -hmm. So we got busy and learned as much as we could about it, and we talked about it during the environmental assessment. We asked the panel to have NALCOR look at it. NALCOR said consistently throughout the entire environmental assessment process, there will be no effects beyond the mouth of the river. Honestly, the, the, the day that they said that in the hearings, I, I stood up, I couldn't help myself, and I said to Gilbert Bennett, so, Mr. Bennett, do you plan on putting signs out for the fish to tell them not to swim beyond the mouth of the river? It was so ludicrous that this man was saying that methylmercury could not flow out the mouth of the river. I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But what they were trying to say was that there was a mixing of the salt water and the fresh water right at the mouth of the river, and therefore none of this methylmercury would ever get past it. Nunatsiavut is the Inuit um, people. They have a land claims, and they're in the north of Labrador. They, has, they, they couldn't believe it either. They, they didn't understand how this could be. So luckily for them, when they signed their land claim, they, their land wasn't in the area of the river or the project, but they had a little uh, caveat to their, to their uh, land claim that said, any development that affects water that runs by our land, then we get to have a say about it. So luckily for, for them, they were able to, uh, to jump in and say, wait a minute, we don't believe that methylmercury is going to stop at the mouth of the river. Now, of course, that it is. They said no. They had to go hire Harvard University to come up and do two years of studies. And Harvard University said, if an Inuit or any person that currently eats country food on a regular basis, and remember that that. Twenty-eight ninety-nine for the four hamburgers up in Hopedale, okay? So country food is something they've lived on and still have to. So if any person who eats country food right now for most of their meals, if they continue to eat the same food at the same level after this project goes into effect, that their mercury levels in their body can rise by 1,500%. It's coming out of the soil because 
Even though Nalcor has cut some trees around the bathtub ring, all below that is going to be flooded. The soil, the trees, the willows, the branches, everything is going to be flooded under the water. So any mercury that's in the soil is going to end up being acted upon by bacteria, creating methylmercury, be taken up by plankton, taken up by small fish. Well, naturally occurring in some cases, but a lot of acid rain too. But it's in the soil. As long as it's in the soil and you don't eat a whole bunch of dirt, you're not going to get mercury poisoning. It's in all soil, especially down here where coal plants operate, right? Yeah, so anytime you're burning uh, fossil fuels, there's, there's going to be mercury in the air. and Yeah. So what's happening is, uh, you know, now for, and, and now we understood, once Harvard came out with this study, we suddenly understood why Nalcor consistently said, no effects beyond the mouth of the river. Because they did not want to get into this study. They did not want to get into this issue, and thank God for Nunaziavut that they did call Harvard. And Harvard University has not done just one study on mercury. They've been all through the north. They've done lots of studies on methylmercury. So this wasn't a new thing for them. And they did a full two-year study. They put out all kinds of test areas. What they found was that there wasn't mixing at the mouth of the river, that in fact it's a laminar situation where salt water is down here in a huge amount and the fresh water comes out from the rivers and lays on top and all the organic matter that comes off the river which would be the, the drowned trees, the drowned soil, all that organic matter sits right here. And in that layer, there's actually more methylmercury created than if there was no salt water underneath. Oh. So that's why the height, the, 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 num the amount of methylmercury that could be in the Inuit diet and in their bodies is so high. So the answer for Nalcor and our government is to issue consumption advisories. That's all they think they can do. Now, a year and a half ago, the town got completely uptight about this because suddenly Nalcor wanted to raise the water levels to 22 meters in the reservoir in the, in the fall to protect the infrastructure that was already built. I remember I showed you a picture of the, of the spillway that, where the, where the uh, gates are. That was already built, and they wanted to raise the levels so that when the, uh, uh, the ice froze, it froze in big chunks and not frazzle ice. Frazzle ice would have caused all kinds of damage to this spillway. So when they said they're going to raise the water levels, the entire community got involved. And I, I think I've got some pictures here. Uh, I'm going to go on beyond this and go back. Oh, here we are. The entire community gets involved and says, "No way! You're not raising. You're not raising these water levels. Not going to happen. We we don't want to see that happen." So we're over at the gates, entering into where the site is. We're more RCMP there than us most of the time, and God knows it costs them like two hundred and forty thousand dollars to keep RCMP in there for about a week. This is one young young fella said why wild food shouldn't be poisonous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make muskrat right. There's a there's a site called makemuskratright.com mm -hmm. and you can find the study from Harvard on that site mm -hmm. if you're interested in looking at it. There is a um, a synopsis of the study and then there is the full study. <laughs> Here's our littlest drummer. God love her, she's a, one of the best mm -hmm. drummers you and she goes right along with every single po protest that we do. Here we are with, like I said, more RCMP officers than us. There's the community going. Here we are just having a, a, a walk on the North Spur. We, we wanted to go down to the North Spur and go down to the falls one more time and, you know, feel, feel the last time for the falls because by, by the time we were finished with that, another month later, then they flooded the, the 22 feet high and the falls was underwater. 
Here we are. This is our Janet Cooper, our uh, photographer. <laughs> She's been nominated, and here she is coming up the river, up to the hill after we've been down to the falls. Here she is down below, and she's taking a picture of the RCMP officer who is taking a picture of each one of us as we come up the hill. And actually, they use those pictures to put 60 different people through the courts. They're going through the courts right now for, for disobeying an injunction. Because of our walks on the, on the North Spur and because of our uh, stopovers at the, at the site and stopping vehicles from going in, now Cor went to court and got an injunction. And the injunction is all encompassing. You can't go anywhere near anything that Nalcor owns. But we've never done anything to hurt anything that Nalcor owns. We're simply trying to get methylmercury taken care of and the North Spur taken care of. Who owned the land before Nalcor? I mean, it was considered crown land. Okay, okay the Innu owned it, the new Nazi of what government New Nazi of people, the Inuit, the Innu, and the Metis people. Basically, the Aboriginal people. As far as they're concerned, it's their land. The Crown Corporate, the Crown, it's called Crown Lands when no person owns it or no company owns it. It's been ceded to uh, Nalcor, along with the water rights to the river. But that's another story. I'll get into that in a minute. So here's the whole community coming out. And then what happened is, we were all over at the site, and suddenly someone decided they were going to go inside the Nalcor gates. Sixty people went inside the gates. One of them was a, a, a reporter from the Independent. His name is Justin Brake. He went with them because he wanted to document everything that took place. They went in, and they shut the place down for five days. The whole project was shut down. So there was a big marathon meeting between the three Aboriginal leaders and the uh, government of Newfoundland and Nalcor. They went on for 11 hours. They made an agreement that they would lower the, the reservoir in the spring, which would have been this past spring, so that scientists could go in and study every section of that reservoir and figure out how much of this uh, uh, soil and vegetation had to be removed in order to mostly mitigate the problem of methylmercury. It came spring when Nalcor was supposed to lower the water and they started to lower, they, they were forced on June 21st, which is the first day of summer, they finally were forced to start lowering the water, but what happened when they started to lower the water, the banks up river started caving in and they had to stop. So, guess what? All of that, whatever land and whatever soil was in that area is already leached into the water, mm -hmm. and that methylmercury is already an issue. So this year, in the fall, this fall, they have to raise it one more meter. So they're up to 23 meters right now to protect their infrastructure. And we still don't have any scientists who have gone up the river and done any studies. So again, we don't believe what Nalcor tells us, we don't believe what our government tells us, and here we are. This is uh, this the uh, community of Rigolette, which is one of the communities that would be uh, going out on the ice in the, in the spring and getting their seals and their fish and whatever. This lady used to be a, uh, the mayor of Rigolette. She's, being, she's been arrested. She's gone in with, into jail with her hands in handcuffs. My friend Marjorie Gowdy, same thing. She was dragged off by the RCMP. She's in handcuffs. Marjorie Flowers, the girl on the right there, she was dragged off in handcuffs. There's a picture on, online, uh, a video of her just being manhandled in the middle of the evening in the dark, dragged across the ground. This is a grandmother, okay? And the two of them, not, not these two, but Marjorie and one other lady was sent to the maximum men's prison in St. John's. 600 miles away. This is for trying to protect their land and the food that they eat. So our efforts at home haven't been that great. So far, Muskrat Falls is still ongoing. They got about 80% of the project finished, 
but the Gull Island project is looming. They're already talking about doing Gull Island. That will be the death of that river. Once that project is in, it'll be three huge reservoirs, and that free-flowing river will be done. Finished. I don't, I want to go back to some of these other pictures if you've got a few minutes extra, <laughs> because I, it, it's important that you understand some of these other things. Okay, so this is what Nalcor has, has already planned. It's not just the Churchill River in Labrador. This is Eagle River. This is in a book that I have at home that's this thick and top. It's done studies on all the rivers in Labrador. And these are the nine rivers now that they decided have potential for hydroelectric power. Eagle River is one of the world-renowned salmon rivers. It's one that uh, uh, George Bush Sr. has fished on mm -hmm. and Prince Philip and people from all over the world have come to Eagle River to fish salmon. That's slated for a possible hydro dam. Here are the rest of the river. This is the Eagle River Plateau or Eagle River uh, watershed. This one is uh, St. Louis and the Paradise River, the Alexis River, the Pinware River. All these rivers are in southern Labrador. And we don't need the power. Labradorians don't need that power. That's all being slated for sale down here. This young man here is Joel Heath. Joel is a scientist from St. John's, Newfoundland. He went up to Hudson Bay. And, and here's where I start to spread my, my concerns out to not just the Muskrat Falls project in my river, but every single river across northern Canada. He's in James Bay for seven years, sitting in a little box, looking at eider ducks, because the people in Santa Kilowack have called up and said, something is wrong, our ducks are dying. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's happening. There's a movie or a documentary called People of a Feather, if you ever get a chance to watch it. I have some copies of it, but there's never enough time in one of these meetings to show the movie. It's like 23, 23 minutes long or something. Anyway, Joel sat there for seven years. He did the studies. The water coming out of the, the hydro projects in James Bay, just like the situation on our river, it's fresh water. It's being produced in the middle of the winter which is not normal. The freshet usually comes out in the spring when there's no ice or ice is breaking up. It's coming out in the winter, it freezes faster than the, than the salt water, and it's freezing these ducks in and they cannot get down below the water to get their food. Oh, it's killing thousands of them. I, I, tears come in my eyes every single time I see this movie. I can't stand it. And Joel sat there in this little box for seven years, off and on, taking pictures of these ducks with under, underwater cameras. It's an amazing documentary. There's two things about this little project that we need to know. Not only that hydro projects are damaging everything, even Hudson Bay. Hudson Bay is monstrous. Mm -hmm. And these ducks don't migrate, so they're sitting there freezing in for oh years. God. The people in Santa Kilowack use, you can see they're, they're in their uh, uh, eider down coats. They use the fur for their coats, they use it to stuff coats, they sell the fur, the fur, sorry, feathers. <laughs> <laughs> I got fur on the mind. Feathers, these eider duck feathers, as probably we all know, are the warmest feathers in the world. We, we go out and pay fortunes Six, seven hundred bucks for an eider down coat. And most of the feathers probably come from here. Mm -hmm. That's what they make their living at. But you, if you watch this movie, you see that they, they're very careful how they d collect the feathers. The feathers are in the nest. And the mother sits on the, on the eggs and she feathers the nest with these feathers. They go along and they pick some, but they always leave enough for the, for the nest. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the bird to sit back on her eggs. It's an amazing documentary. And this young man has spent his life working on this. He's a, he has a PhD, he got a Fulbright scholarship from Washington State University, and he's doing more work up there right now. But please try to see that show. Go on the 
arcticidersociety.com, and you can see some uh, trailers from the, from the movie. One other thing that he's thinking, that he's realizing is happening, is not just that these eider ducks are dying because of all these hydro projects in James Bay. If you look at Hudson Bay, I'm looking north, <coughs> Hudson Bay is like this, James Bay, Hudson Bay. Mm -hmm. The currents in Hudson Bay go from this side, down around the Belcher Islands and up this way, and then down over Labrador to the Labrador Current. The Labrador Current is an, is a, has a thermocline or an underturning, and it affects the climate. It affects climate in, in Europe, mm -hmm. and it affects the climate in, in uh, Quebec and in Labrador. That has been slowed down because of all the fresh water that's coming out of those hydro projects in the middle of the winter. That's, that's his theory right now. He hasn't gone back to work on it yet. Okay, so that's just about all I have. Um, I could go on forever with all these issues. If you, want, if you want to ask some questions and have a discussion, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes? Well, I, I guess I have two questions. One, um, Hamid mentioned about methane, and you really didn't talk about that. Do you have projections of how much methane will be released? And I, the second question is strategy. What is, what is the strat? What kind of? The second question is about strategy to stop this. Just a little question. Just a little question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, about the methane. First of all, we all know. We've always known that methane is produced in reservoirs. So, in my work and my studying about it, and I'm no scientist, I, I, I have an uh, undergrad degree in uh, environmental studies, I couldn't even, my math was so old by the time I started university at age 50, they said, you want to get into a science program? I don't think so. You have to take some science courses first. And I thought, oh God, here we go. Anyhow, uh, what, I, what I thought about was that Methane was only produced when, it, when it's kicked through the turbines and the water is kicked up, and that releases those methane gas bubbles, okay? That's all I knew about. Mm -hmm. But about a week or two ago, there was a new study that came out that said, even in temperate reservoirs, the methane issue is extremely higher than they ever thought it was wow. before. They've done some studies on a lake in uh, Ohio and, and that's where they've come up with some of these uh, uh, predictions. But uh, I, I wish I, it came out since I've been here, since I've been on the road, and I have not had time to read it. It was done by New Science. So if you want to go online and look at, New excuse Science. me, I also contracted a cold while I was on this trip. Uh, if you want to go online and look up New Science and ask about a methane, new methane study, you can probably. Uh, you mean the, mag the journal New Science? Yes. Okay, yes. New Science. Yes. And apparently there's a lot more issue with methane than we ever thought before. We knew that down in the tr tropical regions there was methane issues and CO2 issues and that they're often much higher than even fossil fuel plants. But not in the temperate zones, not in the northern reservoirs. Now they're saying, nope. Okay. So there weren't any projections in their no. environmental impact statement, no. whatever that's called. They no. Didn't, they and didn't. Nalcor would have said there was no effect beyond the top of the water, probably. <laughs> no. No, they, th they say they accounted for all of the uh, CO2 uh, that would be produced. And, and they accounted for, you know, tractor trailers and, and, and uh, graders and all the equipment and all that. And that's all we can go by. And how to stop it? That's a good question, and that's why I'm here. And, I, and, and I'm asking for help. And I'm asking you folks to look at the other end of the power cord and, and tell me what we can do. As we've gone through these different meetings, and, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of people that's helped uh, uh, organize all of this. And Tom's been involved, Annie Wilson, and in New York has been involved, Meg Sheehan in uh, Massachusetts. Mm. All of these people have been involved in helping get this going. And what we've tried to do is keep 
get people to sign on and we have a sign on sheet up front. Let's try to pull together something uh, a little more substantial. Now that people start to know a little bit more about it, at some point let's get together and do more. Uh, for instance, TD Bank, Toronto mm. Dominion. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. TD Bank is yes. Toronto Dominion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Toronto Dominion Bank is the main supplier of the money for this project. Okay? So let's look at the possibility of talking to Tor Toronto Dominion or having maybe at some point in the future a little protest and can pass around once we form a, a good coalition and that won't happen until I get back after, after Christmas and we'll just try to, and if we have your email address and we can invite you to join us and, and you can do that and we'll try to get some uh, conference calls going and, and have a chat about what we can do. What, what kind of media has, has what kind of articles or, or TV or documentation? I am going to Connecticut tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, I cannot tell you, honestly, the name of the uh, TV channel, but it's a local TV channel. Um, PBS, I believe, uh -huh. PBS channel, and I'm going to have a, a one-hour interview about this, and then it's going to be passed around. I will get a DVD, and I can share it with everyone. It sounds to me like what's driving this, this whole thing is uh, maybe some of the nuclear power plants being taken offline. That's what you were saying. It's what's driving the demand to try and increase hydro. In new, yes, exactly. And you guys are saying hydro is, going to, is polluting us just as much as a lot of other yes. sources of uh, yes. you know, fossil fuel plants and stuff like this. So, you know, it, we, we need power. We need to get it from someplace. But uh, and I mean, it sounds to me like wind, you know, and maybe solar, maybe something that we need to start looking a lot more at and uh, start getting in. But right now, in this country, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a high mm -hmm. priority at all. And, and your president is going to make it less of a priority, right, yeah, I understand. One thing you have to remember is like the states, each state right. in the United States has way more power than our provinces do in, in Canada, okay? And, and, and I, can't, uh, I can't lay out the reasons why, but I just happen to read a lot of stuff about each state can, can do more to stop things than our provinces can do and the way they're set up or whatever. So think about this, that every time you buy power from Hydro-Quebec, you get the job to build a little transmission line, just like we get jobs to build this stupid muskrat falls for three years, and then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. No more jobs. Yeah. And no more money to put into wind energy. I mean, we have it legislated. We can't even build a power plant and provide it to our coastal communities, it's against the law to put it on the grid. It seems like, yes, it seems like corruption, political corruption in your area is the basis of everything. You wouldn't really think about solar way up in the far north. You think of, when you talk about the wind potential, it's just phenomenal. And to have exactly. it precluded, that rules you off. The, these trees that were all logged up, they were stabilizing that quick clay. Exactly. The, the, the decomposing organic matter in anaerobic conditions, is, methane is going to come Thank out. you. The, to, to, and the tar sands, the, the methane is coming out from, from exactly. all these, you know, melting of the tundra in anaerobic conditions, the methyl mercury. Engineers are not going to solve this. They're, they're yeah. tweaking a, an impossible project. They're going to be bankrupt. I think all the, the, the they want to put the, bring this power down to the United States. We in the, we in the states we should refuse to buy the. Thank you. We, yeah. need to, we I get, appreciate that. We have to talk that. to our governments, prevent them from buying it, explain what what the devastating environmental exactly. consequences for the environment plus for the native people there. I mean, I, it is so corrupt from top to bottom. It is corrupt. We Everything know it's corrupt. In fact, our, our we've asked. What the, I have a little form, piece of paper here. The three, the three things we have asked for time and time again is the two things I mentioned. Number one, we want an independent study of the North Spur. And we want the independent scientists that they promised us a year and a half ago during that 11th hour meeting. By the way, 
During that meeting, before that meeting, there were three young people that were on hunger strike for 10 full days. That's why that meeting took place, because three young people, three Inuk people, decided they were not going to take this. They were on hunger strike for 10 days. When that marathon meeting ended, the uh, leader of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuavut and the Innu Nation called those three hunger strikers in Ottawa and said, great, you can, you can eat now because we've made a decision. We're going to, to uh, send the scientists in. We're going to study how much of this soil we have to take out in order to mitigate the methylmercury. So they had their smoked fish with our MP, Yvonne Jones, and they thought, this is great. We've made a good deal. Our hunger strike has brought us something. And then the spring comes, and we have to get in the news in order to even get them to start to lower the water level. They start, and a day later, two days later, the banks are falling in. They got to stop, and that's the end of it. It's never been lowered. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to clarify something that was said from the floor of one of the star vetting people just so that we know how it really works here in New York, is that, and Tom can clarify too, um, it used to be that our power was a regulated monopoly, but now only National Grid, which is delivering, they call themselves pipes and wires, they deliver unregulated power that's purchased from wherever. And many people in this group have probably signed things where they want to have a certain percentage of their wind, to, of their power to be wind. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. a way. Now, the electrons that come are going to be where they come from, but that means that we're the regulated, where the people buy their power is rate is chosen by the people who say we okay. want a certain percentage. So in terms of what you were saying, we should not buy this. It is unregulated. Generation in New York is un in every part of the country and Massachusetts is unregulated. Mm -hmm. What is regulated here is the pipes and wires. That's who you get your bill from, National Grid. Mm -hmm. That's regulated. But all of where all of the generation, the hydros around here is unregulated, and it's a it's a purchase. It's a it's a it's a it's a auction that they buy things. So there is some little bit. I mean, you know, it's always hard to have you know people versus the utilities. But there is some little bit of power that you can say where you want your power to come. As many of us in here have signed and said we want a certain percentage to come from wind. From wind so or I just wanted to clarify that, that there is two sort of generation is open and as much of it is purchased from Hydro Quebec yeah. in this part Absolutely. of the world. And Hydro Quebec is probably the driver behind you got it. What you're talking about. Exactly. Right. So we've asked for a real forensic audit for this project. We want to know why it went from 2.9 billion back in before it started, and then to 6.2 billion, and now to 12.7. And I guarantee you, I, I'm, I, if I had a million dollars, I'd say I'd bet a million dollars, but I don't have it. But I'm betting you that this project's going to end up being $15 billion easily. And can I just say one more thing yes. about yes, deregulation of, yes. of generation here? It was driven because we have industries in this part of the country. And industries came up, you know, GE and paper mills and big industries that we have that you don't have. Right. I, I'm assuming. No, we don't. Um, that you don't have. It, the powerful industry said, whoa, dude, you know, they were locked in at six cents a kilowatt hour, which they thought we can do better than that with the byproduct of our of our industry. Industry. Right. We can produce our own power mm -hmm. and we don't even need you guys anymore. And then six dollars a six cents a kilowatt hour became suddenly like, you know Three cents. Not such a such a good deal. Yeah. And that pushed deregulation here so people had to say, but you don't have that. You don't have that heavy right. industry that's going to say, no, we're not buying that at that price. Right. Are you kidding? Because we can do it better. What you, you know, what you wish you would have would be municipalities maybe 
yeah. that could have the power to get together. But they've already thought about that. Yeah. They've already thought that through, and they put some legislation. You just have to break it. Yeah. Yeah. And our, our municipalities, we have two large ones. My community is 7,500 people. And the uh, other larger one is about 8,500. And all the rest of the communities, the other 12,000 people, is in communities of 1,000, 600, 500. But what about in, indigenous with separate legislations and separate powers that might be able to, you know, because these were indigenous land, obviously it wasn't there. But, I mean, that's... I, I, I'm not... I'm not well, getting the gist you know, of your sort of question. Treaties, treaties to be called back on and say treaties of our lands and our waters and our, you know, those aren't. I guess that. Well, I mean, if they were powerful, they wouldn't. If they were have. powerful, they wouldn't. The the issue is that our Aboriginal uh, groups are. I mean, when you look at what Matthew Kuncom and New York State and the people of New York did. 20 years ago to stop the Great Whale Project, as, as uh, Tom said. Um, that was because the entire Cree nation was on side. Right. They used all of their money to send these people down here. They, had, they were totally financed as far as they could be financed. What's happen, happening now is that like the Innu Nation, for instance. The Innu Nation's up in Labrador with maximum 4,000, 5,000 people in two separate groups. So no matter, you know, they stopped low-level flying, and then they agreed to allow it to happen because they got some money, and they got a home, or they got whatever. Then they tried to stop Muskrat Falls, and then they signed on to it. Because they need some money and they need some jobs and they need some infrastructure. And that was the only project on the radar that they figured it was the last one that was going to bring them anything, so they signed on to it. But the leaders signed on, and I'm going to tell you that this, this one elder named um, George Gregoire wrote an article in the Labradorian, our little old rag newspaper, um, Oh, it's been a couple of years ago, but I brought it up um, and, and posted it not long ago. And George said, he, it's called um, Confessions of an Innu Elder. And if you wanted to go online and, and read it, you, you could. It's, it's under the Labradorian. Confessions of an Innu Elder. And he reports in that article that when they signed the New Dawn Agreement, the Innu people, the people themselves, all they, they all speak Innu. They don't, a lot of them don't write English, they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. Or if they speak it, they speak it very, very little. So they thought they were signing a land claim agreement. When they found that Muskrat Falls was a part of the agreement and, and Gull Island, the river was gone, they were so upset. And there's so many of them in that community that are still upset about it. Yeah. But an Innu community always goes by their leaders. It's just the way their culture is. They're not going to go against their leaders. Some will, a few have. I mean, we know people, is, some is, of our... Is it their culture or is it their colonized culture? Colonized culture, I'd okay. say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they don't trust the white person right. and the white people, so who are they going to trust? They have to trust their leaders. Yes, Tom. Yeah. I just wanted to make a few points. These projects are going to be very difficult to, to fight for a lot of reasons. One is the power companies plan ahead 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So they're always looking way, way ahead. And we have here in New York and in the United States, we're hearing a lot, a lot more talking from environmentalists of the need to electrify like our motor vehicles. So if we start using more electric cars and trucks and things like that, we're going to need electricity for that. And it's going to have to come from somewhere. So that would probably lead to more and an increase in the amount of electrical capacity in kilowatt hours used. Then another thing is um, the geothermal industry is beginning to take off now and, and become a major industry. It's going to probably be a lot bigger in 10 years than it is now. And when people use geothermal, what they're doing is they're replacing like natural gas 
to heat their homes with, with electricity because you might, whatever you're spending in natural gas, you'll eliminate that, but then you'll be using half as much um, again in electricity. So if we, if we build up a big geothermal industry to heat buildings, we're going to be using more electricity to, to provide for that. So we have some difficult choices of head. How are we going to replace the fossil fuels? How are we going to shut down the new plants? And how are, we, how are we not going to replace it with these really dangerous hydroelectric stations? And that's that's a real tall order, you know. Yes. So I think part of it has to be vastly more energy efficiency, yes, more conservation, Absolutely. and I think more solar and, and wind in some places, maybe offshore wind. Um, offshore wind seems to be working off of the off of um, Block Island. There's some big towers that. Like one windmill generates five million miles of power. <coughs> but a lot of people don't like them because they're they think they're ugly. Yeah. Pretty noisy. But we have we have a lot of challenges in front of us. That's what they all with climate change yeah. all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Like what they're doing to the rivers. I don't think ugly. we can. Uh, yeah. I don't think we can rely on the marketplace yeah, right. to <laughs> resolve this. Right, sir. I don't think we can rely on the marketplace to resolve this. I think there's a lot of good technologies out there that need to be applied. Certainly energy conservation, you can take all these fluorescent lights and put LEDs in and cut your power by 90%. And that's, that's but you need a, a government that actually sells you the LED light bulbs at cost. You know. Uh, to force the issue, to policy right. I found I found issue. one today at the uh, Dallas store for a dollar. <laughs> but that's rare, that's very rare. <laughs> So, so you really need a authority at a higher level that actually does these inputs, outputs, and it has to be it has to be for the public. It has to be public power because it really most of the energy companies started as public municipal power mm -hmm. once they discovered so they could electrify a grid in a municipality. Going after labor. Is one way we help stop Thank you. the great will. We got the utility workers in New York to come out against it, and then the building trades finally did, which was a minor miracle in New York State to get the building trades to come out against um, bringing the power down from Canada. Because we had a stu study done by this guy Goodman, yeah. who showed that the uh, the jobs generated by producing our own power would be much greater than buying the Canadian power. So is Mr. Goodman still alive? He's in Boston. I'm going to be in company, Boston tomorrow night. His first his name is Ian. Ian, <clears throat> Ian Goodman. Goodman. Ian Goodman. Yeah, he would. Could you reach out to him and if I? I don't him? have his contacts. Would you? you Tom, have be able to? I, could, I could probably find it. We have about five more minutes. Yeah. We should stop at about. So, five so five I just want to say one other thing. Sure. The the whole dynamics of the marketplace under a system that has to have greater profits every year in order to satisfy its underlying motivation is going to take the commons, which is any of the land or processes that are owned by the people, indigenous people in the country, people in the cities, they take away the commons. They did this starting in England with the turn of the Industrial Revolution, and they privatize it. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a profit center where you get privatization. So in Puerto Rico, they're probably going to try to privatize the um, public power utility now because of what they call disaster capitalism. So there's a lot of stuff being written on this and the, the solution is, is basically going to be more interventions like Tom did, and I did one too with the PSC, because this you know, our public service commission does not do a job for us. You know, it's the, the utility bills continue to go up and up and up and up. And we go to we go to their meetings, and we when they just one more thing when they when Cuomo had made the deal with Energy to give seven billion dollars of our ratepayer money to the three or four nuclear power plants left in the state and closed Indian Point, right? It was seven billion dollars, and the workers from these plants came to the Public Service Commission hearing. Now, for that seven billion dollars, they could close down all of them, which they're still going to have a third of the workforce watching the spent fuel, they could have given each worker a million dollars to start their business. I did the math, it came to like less than two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So energy is going to get the five billion on top of that, which is probably even more, 
from our rate utility bills, and the PSC said they were doing their job when they did that. So we we have to we have, have to um, watch. We major have to be, interventions. Yep, yeah. yeah, we we all have to keep on this. I you know, I get so confused when we're talking about energy and and transmission lines and power and how it's transmitted. But one thing I do know is that I don't care what it costs. It's too expensive to put mud lake. Greg, Greg Chalk is one of my good friends. He lives in Mud Lake. Mm -hmm. It's no matter what the cost, any co it, it, I don't care how high it is, and if you shut it down, I don't care. Those lives are worth that, and and the people who have to eat that fish up yeah. up on the northern coast because they can't a frozen hamburger diet. Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry, you had a question. And I, well, I was just wondering, you had mentioned in the beginning about the different ways to capture hydro energy. Mm -hmm. You were talking about Niagara Falls. The, I forget the term you used for it. So, uh, uh, run of river, I think run Tom, Tom mm -hmm. mentioned that. Run of river right. projects don't do near as much damage as dams and reservoirs. How, how, how much do they produce? Is it, is it feasible to do, to do that? In our river, it would have been because the, the, the river actually flows. If you paddle that river like we do every, nearly every year, um, there's one area that's a big lake. It's called Winnicapow. It's, the, it's called the Windy Lake. And that lake is just, it's 26 miles. Of, you're paddling for three, uh, three hours, three. <laughs> you're paddling for uh, 12 hours straight. And, but after that, the river runs at about 20 knots, between 20 and 25 knots. Mm -hmm. So really, you could produce lots of power by just putting a turbine on the side of the river and let, you know, yeah, it's going to hit a few fish. There's no question. Anything we do, I walk out that door tonight yeah, and, you, you know, you we're doing stuff. something to affect the environment. But what you tr try to do is the least amount of damage. And if we needed the power, we could put that kind of a run of river high, uh, uh, turbine along the side of the river. We could put a dozen of them, and it still wouldn't make the, the damaging effect of damming the river. I think we have to stop there. Okay, there's, uh, Roberta has some t-shirts for sale and some cards, and there's some literature, tourist literature, or literature from Labrador, if you want, that's for free in the back. Up on the table upstairs. Yeah, a couple of magazines. If it's your first form, sign free. the email list and please yes, put your please, chair away. Please sign the email. We've got some nice maps of Labrador. Where do you want the chair? If you want to take a look at the wall.